Hello everybody, welcome to Colonel's debut in Taiwan. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. Liang, who's been a tremendous help to uh, Kronos, a real friend to us as we have organized our tour here in Taiwan. Thank you very much. So we have a full day of presentations uh, for you uh, this, uh, today. Uh, we split it up into four main sessions, uh, two this morning with a break and two this afternoon uh, after lunch. Uh, the first session, we're going to give you a high level overview of Kronos, uh, our activities, and we are going to give you a high level overview also of our new educational initiative, which we call KITE. And then Dr. John Petty is going to give us a broad industry perspective of the impact of standards in the industry. Then after the break, we're going to focus on 3D. Uh, we have uh, three um, APIs we're going to discuss, OpenGL, OpenGLES, and OpenGLSC. And then after lunch, we'll give uh, an overview of more of the APIs, uh, OpenCL and the new Web APIs that we're working on, WebGL and WebCL. And then finally, the Vector Graphics API, uh, OpenVG. And then in the last session, we'll switch over to the audio and video APIs, OpenMaxAL and OpenSL ES. And we'll finish the day with questions, but if you have any questions during the day, feel free uh, to ask or catch us during the break. You know, we'll be very happy uh, to answer any questions that you have. So I'm going to start uh, by giving uh, a high-level overview of the Kronos Group and our activities and some of the uh, forward-looking projects that we have uh, underway. If you haven't come across Kronos before, you know, what, what is Kronos? Who are we? Um, we are an open standards organization. Uh, we're open in a number of different ways. We are open membership. That means any company in the world, internationally, is free to join Kronos uh, participate in the working groups, have a vote in the development of these specifications. So if your company is interested in the work that we're doing here, uh, you don't have just to watch. You can come and join and participate and help us uh, create the specifications that are good for your business. We're also open in that the specifications and APIs that we create are freely and openly available. There are no royalties, no money to pay. Any company in the industry can use these specifications completely free of charge. We focus on creating APIs that are very close to the silicon. We like to, to say we connect silicon to software developers. Uh, advanced silicon for graphics, for parallel computation, for audio, video processing, sensor processing. We have low-level APIs that let software developers access the capabilities of that advanced silicon acceleration. Because our APIs are low-level, uh, they form the foundation of the software ecosystem. And they're typically needed on almost every platform. So our APIs are quite widely uh, deployed in the industry. So I'm going to structure my talk this morning uh, to reflect how we see the evolving needs of these APIs in the industry. Kronos has been uh, in operation for over 10 years, and we started out by creating APIs for high-end desktop machines. We have APIs like Desktop OpenGL and now OpenCL for graphics and compute. Over the last few years, though, we've seen mobile devices become increasingly important. And now mobile devices, as you know, have tremendous amounts of acceleration and compute power. So now we need APIs not just for acceleration, but for acceleration at very low power levels. So we have 
dedicated APIs for the mobile industry, such as OpenGLES and OpenSLDS, uh, that are specifically engineered for mobile and embedded uh, devices. But still, the high-end APIs are relevant to the mobile industry because the technology is often created first in the high-end desktop APIs, and then that functionality will flow down into the mobile APIs. Right now, we're in another revolution where we want to enable more advanced applications, such as augmented reality on mobile devices. So in the past, we could afford to have separate APIs, a graphics API, a video API, a sensor API, and they would not talk, did not need to talk to each other. But with advanced applications like augmented reality, now these APIs have to work together in a very sophisticated way. We have to be able to pass video into graphics. We need to have sensor fusion that's driving a graphics uh, application. So now we have APIs like OpenMax and EGL that are enabling graphics and video and the other uh, acceleration blocks in an SOC to work very closely together and very efficiently for applications like augmented reality. And I'm going to give you some insight into how we're doing uh, all of these different APIs. Then finally, we have HTML5. Lots of different types of devices using advanced silicon acceleration. It's not just mobile phones. It's now tablets and TVs and set-top boxes, automobiles. Software development uh, community needs to be able to write portable code that can run across many different devices, many different form factors. And HTML5 seems like it has a good chance to be a genuine cross-platform programming environment. So we now have web APIs that integrate into HTML5. WebGL is the first. WebCL is coming soon. And I'll give you some more details about those as well. So let's start by looking uh, at the Kronos organization. How do we actually work as a group? Uh, if you want to get involved, uh, this is the, the family that you would be joining. Uh, we have over 115 companies now that are uh, Kronos members. Almost any uh, silicon vendor that is creating acceleration uh, IP is now a member of the Kronos group. But we also have operating system vendors like Google. Uh, we have uh, mobile carriers. We have tools vendors, middleware vendors, application uh, vendors. So we have a good representation from the industry. And the work that Kronos does is driven by the membership. There is no big agenda. It's the members coming together in a safe place to cooperate, to create open standards that help the industry, are good for the business of the membership. So here is the set of APIs uh, that Kronos is currently working on. We have the 3D uh, APIs, uh, OpenGL, OpenGLES, and WebGL. We have uh, the Compute APIs, uh, OpenCL, and the web version, uh, uh, WebCL. We have EGL, which is an API that's often forgotten, but is becoming increasingly important because it enables the other APIs to communicate to each other. So all these APIs taken together create a visual computing ecosystem, graphics and compute that work very closely together in desktop, in mobile, and on the web. We have one standard that's not an API. It's a file format. It's the Collada 3D Asset Interchange format. We have OpenVG, which is not 3D. It's a 2D vector graphics API. We have the pair of APIs, OpenMax 
and OpenSL ES for video and audio processing. And then we have the newest APIs that I'll give you some detail about uh, today. Stream Input is a new API that's under development for sensor fusion using cameras, gyros, um, touch screens as advanced sensors. And then the newest working group, which we don't even have a formal name for yet, uh, but it's working in computer vision, uh, is a hardware acceleration layer for vision type applications. So you take all of these um, specifications together, they are intended to be more than just a set of individual APIs. We're trying and working hard to make sure that these are a coherent family of APIs that interoperate to create a coherent platform for graphics and compute acceleration. So, how are we organized? Uh, we have a working group for each of those APIs that we just saw. Uh, so, a group of people that are interested in vector graphics participate, for example, in the OpenBG working group. And we have a working group for each API. There are three levels of membership. There is the normal contributor member. They can participate in any of the working groups, and they get a vote in all of the working groups. Uh, we have the promoter members that also have one vote in the working group. They also get a seat on the board of directors. And we have an academic membership level for universities to come and participate uh, in the discussions. The working groups produce specifications. The specifications are made publicly available on our website for anyone in the industry to download and use uh, free of charge. We also, though, create conformance tests. Conformance tests are a vital part of any standard. You need to be able to test the reliability and the quality of implementations. So every specification has a matching conformance test. And companies who want to ship a conformance implementation can download the tests from Kronos. There is a small fee. Uh, but it lets you test as many products as you wish and to use the logo when you are fully conformant. The working groups also create uh, documentation for developers. We have SDKs, we have man manual pages, we have reference cards, and those are typically made free of charge uh, available to, to the public. We're going to talk later, Eric will talk about the new Kite initiative where the working groups now are also reaching out into the educational community, providing guidance and feedback to educators teaching about Kronos APIs. Uh, we want to enable students to be able to learn uh, about the Kronos technologies. So what have we achieved at Kronos in the last 12 months? Um, it's been quite a busy year, uh, we've had a number of new specifications being released. So in January uh, 2011, just, just over 12 months ago, we released OpenMax uh, AL 1.1 and OpenSL DS 1.1, new versions of the APIs for video and audio processing. In March 2011, we released the first version of our first web API, WebGL 1.0, and I'll give you more details later, but it's now beginning to ship in a large number of production browsers around the world. We announced the new working group, Stream Input, for Sensor Input Fusion, and the Collada working group released the conformance tests for Collada 1.4 free of charge uh, into the industry. In August, at SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles, we announced a new working group for WebCL, bringing compute to the browser. And OpenGL announced OpenGL 4.2, a new version of the desktop uh, 3D API. In November, at uh, SIGGRAPH Asia in Hong Kong, 
we renounced OpenCL 1.2. And then finally in December, we announced a new computer vision working group. And EGL working group announced EGL streams, which is an important extension to EGL that I'll give you more detail about in a second. So there's quite a lot of uh, activity uh, during the year. Let's just look briefly at some of those. We'll get more details on a lot of these APIs uh, during the rest of the day. But this is perhaps to let you put things into context uh, next to each other. OpenGL is over 20 years old. Uh, OpenGL has been around for a very long time, originally uh, created by Silicon Graphics uh, in California. Uh, for 20 years has been the way that developers can access the very latest in 3D graphics technology. Four generations of OpenGL, each generation enabling a new class of GPU hardware as GPUs get more and more sophisticated. The first two generations were primarily focused on the pixel pipeline, uh, fixed function pixels and then programmable uh, pixels. OpenGL 3 and 4 are adding more functionality mainly around the geometry, uh, geometry shaders, tessellation and compute to enable very complex shapes and scenes uh, to be rendered at very high performance. Since the OpenGL committee joined Kronos, uh, the number of OpenGL releases has accelerated uh, significantly. We have now six versions of OpenGL released uh, since uh, 2008, uh, when the OpenGL R became a part of the, the Kronos family. So now we have OpenGL 4.2, which is um, really almost ahead of DirectX 11 in terms of uh, advanced graphics functionality, and it's available across uh, any platform. In the 3D family, we have OpenGL ES. Uh, probably many of you are familiar uh, with OpenGL ES. So far, it's been our most widely deployed uh, API. Its ES stands for Embedded Systems. It's a streamlined version of OpenGL that enables uh, 3D functionality to be shipped on mobile and embedded devices. It's become the dominant 3D API uh, across the industry on mobile phones, tablets, uh, set-top boxes, hundreds and hundreds of millions of uh, implementations of um, uh, OpenGL ES have shipped. The latest version is OpenGL ES 2.0, which is a fully programmable pipeline, and is now capable of running high-end content and gaming engines like Unreal Engine 3, uh, Unity, um, running quite high-end content. Um, it's beginning to be pretty hard to tell the difference between a tablet device or a mobile phone with the latest generation of OpenGL ES 2.0 hardware versus a console, the latest, you know, the current generation of consoles. Uh, the gaming looks uh, pretty much the same, and we can show you some demos of that later during the day. Now, OpenGL is for graphics, OpenCL is for compute. And the big idea behind OpenCL is to enable developers to take advantage of any parallel hardware in their system, whether it's GPUs or multi-core CPUs or multiple uh, boards in a system. Uh, we need to enable to uh, developers to write code once and then run it across any of the devices on their platform. So, the basic idea behind OpenCL is not new. It's the idea of rather than writing a sequential loop, you generate a kernel of work and then you distribute that kernel across many different compute elements in, uh, in parallel. And OpenCL has the concept of a host device. So if you're running on a PC, for example, that would be your main um, x86 processor, and then you have uh, compute devices that contain multiple compute units, and you want to be able to distribute the work across 
all these different compute devices uh, to get parallel computation. So how is OpenCL uh, uh, built to enable this? We have three parts to OpenCL. There's a language called OpenCLC, which is very close to ISO C99. We've made the minimum changes uh, to enable parallel computation. Uh, very well-defined accuracy. That's the language that you use to write the kernels that you want to be distributed and executed in parallel. Then you have two APIs. You have a platform API that lets you explore your system and find out what resources are available. And then a runtime API to actually take your kernels, compile them, and distribute them across uh, the, the processing elements. So in December, we announced OpenCL 1.2. It's a pretty significant update. Uh, it's take, we've taken a lot of feedback from the developer community and built them into a new version, but it is sort of backwards compatible. So your 1.2 OpenCL will run your OpenCL 1.1 and 1.0 programs. And we have maintained the embedded profile. The embedded profile is interesting. We, we will never need OpenCL ES uh, because OpenGL was created uh, just for high-end systems. OpenCL realized that it was going to be deployed both on high-end and embedded mobile devices. And so the core OpenCL specification has an embedded profile built inside. And that's beginning to be used. Uh, I think you'll see OpenCL implementations beginning to ship on mobile devices probably during 2012. So some of the major features in 1.2, um, we're going to cover this in more detail uh, this afternoon, but more flexibility about how you use your devices, better image support, uh, better sharing of uh, images between DirectX and OpenCL, uh, installable client drivers, um, just like OpenGL. Uh, but we'll, we'll cover this in more detail uh, in the OpenCL session uh, after lunch. The, we're looking forward with OpenCL. Uh, we have a long-term roadmap where we're um, developing OpenCL next generation with much more flexibility around the memory and execution model. We're cooperating very closely with uh, the WebCL uh, working group. And we're looking to create an intermediate representation. Lots of the games developers don't want to ship source of their kernels. They prefer to ship a binary version that they need to run anywhere on any different platform. And so we're creating an intermediate representation, probably it's going to be based on LLVM. And then finally, we're looking to make OpenCL easier to use. OpenCL is a very low level, very powerful API. You have a lot of control over everything in the system, uh, but it can make it difficult to program for the first time a uh, parallel programmer. So OpenCL HLM, high level model, uh, is creating a uh, higher level language uh, framework to make it easier for first time programmers to create OpenCL programs. 